Most computer systems process information in a sequential manner. You start out with lines of code in the computer program which gets translated into assembly language by the compiler. And then the assembly language gets decoded into microcode on the processor. But everything, every step of the way is done sequentially, one step after another. For example, in this flowchart we show the multiplication of two digits. And we start here, and then we get the first digit, then we get the second digit, and we set our working number, our working register to zero. Then we do a decision to see if either one of these, depending on which one we want to work with, let's say x, if x is equal to zero, then the answer, regardless of what the other digit is going to be, is going to be zero. So we're basically done. We output z and we're done, because z is already set to zero. But if x is not zero, then we, um, we just add the other digit to itself uh, and count down x. So essentially what we're doing is we're multiplying one digit by the other. Now this decision block right here is a very good example of a sequential process because it is an if-then-else. If x is equal to zero, then output z and we're done. Else z equals z plus y. Now over here we have um, quite a different way of doing business and that is it's a parallel process. Now what's inside this bubble can be quite complex. We don't know what's in there. It's a black box if you will. But what's happening here is we're taking these two variables and we're impinging them on whatever this circuit is simultaneously and almost at the same instant we're getting an answer. So this is more like an organic system or a neural network system where everything happens at once. Now you'll get some ripple through this. Obviously nothing can travel instantaneously from point A to point B. But uh, it's still considered to be a parallel process because these two variables are being input into this network simultaneously and an output is being presented almost simultaneously. So this is hardware. This doesn't have, by definition, any sequential processes in it. Therefore, it cannot have code, it cannot have assembly language, it cannot have microcode. This is all done in hardware. So that's why we call this the sequential process or algorithm versus um, parallel systems out. So how do we implement a parallel logic system that can output the product of two digits instantaneously without any sort of sequential logic? Inside most microprocessors, uh, there is a subportion called an arithmetic logic unit, an ALU, where the digits are crunched together, a product or a sum is produced, and um, along with a, it has a carry in and a carry out. But we can build a parallel circuit that is just simply a lookup table. Here I've shown a 7x7 seven seven array. This is a two-dimensional array, one dimension in one direction, the other dimension in another direction, but it's just as easy to get three, four, five, ten, twenty dimensions. You don't need to be scared by that. It's just adding more variables essentially for each new variable you get a new dimension but here we have a very simple two-dimensional lookup table so what happens if we have a uh, one of the digits it's set to one value and the other we immediately have a response by the way that the lines intersect on this lookup table so I'm going to show you an example of this right now in hardware here is a hardware implementation of the 7x7 seven seven multiplication lookup table. Here we have the inputs of one digit on this side. This would be uh, 1 through 7, and then here's 1 through 7. If I press any one of these buttons on one side and not on the other side, I get a result of 0, and that is because whatever this number is is considered to be multiplied by 0 unless I press another button on this side. If I press 1 on this side and multiply it by 1 on this side, 
the result is one. So if I step down two by two, three times three, four times four, five times five, six times six, seven times seven is the maximum number we can get out of this lookup table. And of course, any combination of any of these input digits on either side. So what's happening is that these um, these digits are going into a lookup table and it is taking the data from the intersection of those input variables which end up just being resolved to an address. It goes to that address, it simply looks up um, what is at that address and that's what it outputs. Now this circuit doesn't know anything about numbers. All it knows about is what it wants you to see as a result. So there are two EE proms here um, that drive these two seven segment displays. So when we go to that lookup table and we have an intersection in the matrix of between two digits, what's really happening is as those addresses are being correlated exactly in parallel between these two chips, both of these chips are seeing that same address and, and um, outputting the data that's at that address, but what that data is is not the number. So for instance, if I output a 15, it doesn't know what a 1 and a 5 is. All it's doing is outputting the data that will drive this seven segment display for the elements of B and C that makes a 1, and likewise down here, the segments that will form a 5. So these chips don't know and don't care about the numbers involved. All they want to do is give you the right answer when you press the button. So it's kind of interesting to think about the notion that, um, that not that the machine would know anything about numbers anyway, but obviously if it had to pass this information on to another section of the computing system, it would need to be, you know, a binary or a hex number. But in this case, all it wants to do is show you the right answer and therefore what is contained in these lookup tables is not the number one and five at that location it's the, it's the um, seven segment display driver information to um, to show you the right number and in this case I see uh, number one would be zero six and uh, number five would be 6D. So that's basically using this array of seven segment display lookup values as an output. And here's the circuit. We have our two EEPROM lookup tables here, lower and upper, uh, driving the two seven segment displays. And then all we're doing is we're inputting um, two sets of seven switches. Uh, this set of seven switches goes to the lower um, address bits. It goes through A0 to A6 on both chips. They're in parallel. And then this set of seven switches goes to the uh, address bits A8 through A14. So these chips are 32K chips. They have, um, they have 15 address lines, A0 through A15. What I've done is I've shifted the upper part rather than running six and then immediate, or excuse me seven and then immediately seven more here I've shifted it up so that this would align in the upper nibble and um, or upper byte actually and certainly make life much much easier in terms of setting up the lookup table so we wouldn't have to merge a part of the upper byte and you know one bit into the lower byte that's just a lot more work so um, we have uh, 15 uh, address lines here and that's why we don't go um, 9 by 9 because we don't have enough address lines to do that. There are 40 pin chips that can do that that essentially uh, 256k chips with a, a 16 wide uh, output could all be done on one chip. We could have 9 by 9 running into those and then we could also have um, both 7 segment displays being run off the same chip. Um, but those are a little bit rare and expensive. Um, these are um, kind of inexpensive. Uh, I, I bought these chips used for almost nothing. And um, another thing is for simplicity I'm running each switch into one address line which is obviously a very inefficient way of doing business. 
Um, however, it certainly makes life simple. But it makes the uh, lookup table to be a sparsely populated array, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I will show you a different way that we can do this that would very easily get a 9x9 array into these two chips. Because we are running one switch into one address line, we don't have a sequential set of um, data in our lookup table. This is a 32K chip, and what happens is that um, as our 0 times 0, 0 times 1, all the way up to 7 times 7 gets played out here, the addresses that these translate into, they have big gaps between them. But we start off at address 0 for 0 times 0. For 0 times 1, we end up at address number 1. At 0 times 2, at address 2. But now with 0 times 3, at address 4. And that's because we are stepping that bit one um, one address line over at a time. So we go 4, 8, 10 hex, 20 hex, 40 hex, 100 hex, 101. And you see we get up here and we start making huge jumps. We jump from um, 0840 up to uh, 1000 hex. Then we jump to 2000 hex. So here we're making fairly small jumps between where the population of data is inside this array. And up here we're making huge jumps. We're going from 2,000 hex to 4,000 hex for the next little set of data down here. But it all works out fine. As long as you understand what's happening, it doesn't have to be all sequential. I mean, it's nice when it is, but you can certainly do, um, do it any way you want to. So this is a sparsely populated array. The fill data in this prom for all the locations that aren't specified as actual output are all 0, 0, which which drive the seven segment displays off. Now the data in that seven by seven lookup table matrix contained the actual information that needed to be output to drive the seven segment display. So in the case of a three times five intersection and we were going to put out a one in the upper segment that would be a 0, 06 and a 5 would be a 6D in the lower. So this is the information that was distributed in that matrix for output, not the actual numbers themselves, the seven segment display driver information. Now I built this circuit just to illustrate a simple point and Obviously, it is limited because it is a 7x7 seven seven array and not a 9x9 nine nine or 10x10 ten ten array, depending on how you want to look at it, if you want to count 0 as one of the digits. But we could have built a, um, a 0 through 9 times 0 through 9 array lookup table very easily by using two 10 to 4 line encoders, or priority encoders as they're called what we could have done then is taken nine switches, a zero being considered if no switch is being pressed. So we take nine switches and we hook it up to the input lines of this priority encoder, leaving one of them grounded because we don't need the zero. Same thing on the other one, and then we feed these in through A0 through A7 of these two chips in parallel. Just for the sake of clarity, I've left all these lines out. But these would go here and here. Now you notice that we're not even using all these upper address lines. All these upper address lines would be grounded. So here we have uh, much more input and we have uh, much less use of the address field. Also, our lookup table would be much more compact and much easier to understand and much easier to configure. I don't like to use the word program because program to me signifies a sequential operation. So I usually say uh, uh, configure, but program might be just as good a word. So here we would have um, an additional two chips. These would be 16 pin chips. And then we would be able to uh, use only half of the address lines here and have the same results. 
Now why do they call this a priority encoder? The reason is, is that you have all these switches that are going into individual lines. What happens if more than one of these switches is closed or one of these signals is more than one signal is active at a time? The reason they call it a priority coder, encoder is that it takes the, um, the higher, the more significant um, signal in and it uses that to, um, to encode the output. So if you were to press a 1 and a 9, it would encode the 9 on this output as BCD or binary coded decimal.